Well, welcome. Uh, welcome to Tallgrass at the Well. My name is Dave Geldart. I am the associate pastor at Tallgrass, and uh, we're glad you're here. We're very glad you're here. So uh, just a few announcements before we get started. First of all, I need to announce my answers to this because it's really important. So uh, who's like me in that uh, they are naturally a night owl, but then the more kids you have, you kind of knuckle under and become an early bird. That's, that's where I'm at. Yep, Taylor's there too. So maybe one of these days when they get older, uh, the wonderful night owlness can come back. Hasn't yet. Uh, superpower is flying. I don't even have to think about it. I mean, Superman probably would be my ideal super, superhero. Uh, but some of the, uh, I, I probably would have to wear a coat because it gets kind of cold, right? What if I jumped up into the, you know, into the jet stream and froze? I would have to think through it. But it'd be definitely, it would definitely be flying. All right, like I said, a few brief announcements. First of all, we want you to experience uh, what we're doing together. So we invite you to be a part of it. You're a part of it this morning, or if you're online or here, uh, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're joining us. We want you to join in as much as you can. And so a few opportunities to join in. Uh, First one will be giving. Giving is a great way to join in. A lot of the times... Uh, you know, you really know uh, the things that you're into by uh, following the trail of your money. And so uh, money can be a great way to even lead your heart. And so uh, it could be a great strategic way to join in. Uh, there's a, uh, if you go back to the other slide, there's a Better Together Fund that we've set up. So if you're, if you're a part of Tallgrass, you know our black uh, giving boxes in the back. If you're there, I like that. We're starting to do the, the hoo-hoo. And then uh, the well, you know, you've got your, your wooden joy box back there and... Yeah, tall grass has not caught up to you on that response, so that's really good. So if you're giving in person, the boxes are still back there, but give online, tallgrass.church slash give, or the well, mhk, uh, dot com slash give. But we set up this Better Together Fund for folks who are visiting and uh, aren't coming in feeling like they're a part of tall grass or the well, but they're curious. If you're here and you're curious uh, about what's going on, about two churches trying to work together, this would be a, a way to give. So it's through the tall grass church uh, giving website, and then you choose the fund called uh, Better Together Fund, and we'll split that at the end of each month. So it could be a great way to jump in with giving if you're not sure. A few more things. Another way to join in would be to join a team. So uh, jumping in on a way to serve would be a real strategic, uh, maybe a next step for many of us. Uh, one opportunity is there's a card back there by the giving boxes uh, called the Put Me In Coach card. There's a lot of options. You can check on the back and then put it back in the box. Uh, you can also do it online. Uh, through the Wells website, thewellmhk.com, and then you click on connect, and then you click on join a team. That's right. So there's a lot of opportunities to jump in and, and serve. Hey, you should be impressed. Uh, so uh, please, please jump in and serve with us, not just because we need it, but because it's fun. We're a family. So jump in and experience what it's like not to just sit in a, in a chair, but to jump in and join. Finally, next Sunday, if, you, if you've if you got a, a flyer on your seat, pick it up. Please take it home. We printed it. Uh, we put it on your uh, fridge. Next week, we've got free pizza lunch right after church next week, and it's also going to be a chance to hear uh, more about what we're going to be doing together this fall and ways that you can connect. So briefly, some announcements there. I am going to pray for Sarah as she comes up. Sarah uh, Siders is a co-pastor at The Well. Uh, for all of us tall Grassians, and, uh, and she's going to be bringing the teaching this morning, uh, going through our series on First John, so I'm looking forward to that. Will you join with me in praying for this time? So I'll pray a little bit, and then they'll have this uh, brief little time at the end for you guys to pray uh, just silently too. Jesus, uh, we, I want to say thank you for your word. Uh, I, I thank you for the opportunity to hear from you. So I ask that your spirit would help uh, us to hear your word and understand it. And to help us, uh, confirm to us what it, what it is you're trying to speak, excuse me, to speak to us uh, today. So uh, for the rest of you guys, just take uh, 10 seconds or so to just pray that God would speak to you in this next few minutes. And then pray for Sarah as she preaches. Amen. Good morning, everyone. How are you? All right, good to be here. Um, As Dave said, I am co-pastor here at The Well. My name is Sarah Siders. Uh, Normally, Josh is up here a little bit more than me. We've switched places. Um, Thank you for the wave. I appreciate that. Um, He's actually up in kids right now, holding it down. 
So that's going to be really fun. Uh, we, we like to switch places a lot. We like to just, um, you know, try each other's roles out. And we like to be very pragmatic um, in how we, how we do family. So um, we are going to be talking today a little bit further on this series of First John. So we, um, as, a, as a team, as a pastoral team, we decided, hey, let's, let's look at First John. Let's look at how um, the gospel and the story of Jesus can be begin to transform not just our head, not just our knowledge, but also our hearts, our emotions, our will, and ultimately our lifestyle, our behavior, and decisions. And so we are calling this series Head, Heart, and Hands. Um, so this is our third week here, and um, it was, it's been interesting because I was actually already in the book of First John, um, and at the, the older that I get, I used to read like for quantity, like when I was younger um, in college, I would be like, okay, I read three chapters, and and that, that was good. And I, I don't know, I thought it was like checking a box or something with God. And the older I get, the more I'm like, I think I read like three verses and I'm like, okay, that was a lot. I'm not, how am I supposed to do, what am I supposed to do about that? I have to sit with Holy Spirit and say, okay, you gotta help me. You gotta help me uh, be transformed into what is being asked of me from these three verses. And so it's taken me a very long time to get through First John. But the thing, the other part of it is that John, I don't know if you noticed, but when you read John, whether it's his gospel or his letters, he's very mystical and poetic. And sometimes you're like, John, what are you saying? right now. You know, what are you what do you mean? What do you want me to do about that? And so that's part of the reason I'm I'm kind of going so slowly and methodically through it. So I want to just recap um, some of what John has been talking about, which Pastor Josh and Pastor Ben have talked about in the last two weeks. I'm going to make this extremely simple. So the main point so far, we are God's children. God is our father. And people like us saw, heard, and touched Jesus in the physical body. And love for God and others demonstrates the presence of God's love in our hearts. So throughout the letter of 1 John, he's reminding his readers over and over again about their position in the family of God. He's saying, God's your father, you're his children. And in fact, that's the primary way he refers to God. He, he does say God sometimes throughout, but he's, he usually says father. He says, the love of the Father will be in you. The love of the Father, the love of the Father. So he's always talking about God as Father, and there's a reason for that. So that's going to be our focus today. We're going to be explaining 1 John uh, 2, 15 to 29. And I'm just going to start with the ending at the beginning, because I don't want you to have any surprises. We're, I'm just going to tell you where we're going to end up, okay? Where we're going to end up is, as soon as we forget that God is our Father and we're his children, that's when we get distracted, we get drawn away, we get pulled away by three common temptations. That's it. It's just three things. Three things are going to pull you out of the love of God. And our job in this life is to remember who we are and protect God's word in us so that we can guard against these three temptations. Martin Lloyd-Jones says it very well. The great secret of life, according to our Lord, is to see ourselves and to conceive of ourselves always as children of our Heavenly Father. If only we do that, we shall be delivered immediately of the main temptations that attack us all in this life. These three temptations are the same ones that have distracted and led astray every single person who's ever lived, except Jesus, okay? Every single person except Jesus who has ever lived has fallen prey to these three temptations. And that's why we wanna get very familiar with what they are. So 1 John 2, 15 to 17 lays, this out, lays it out for us. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the, the will of God lives forever. So to be honest, I've read this for you know, um, the majority of my life. And a lot of times it would, it's like, what does that mean, right? What does it mean, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes? And, and, and he's just, he says it and then he moves on. Like you're supposed to know. So if you are someone who's like, I don't really know what that means. If these are the three most common temptations and I'm supposed to be aware of what they are so that I can remain as a child of God and aware that he's my father, I better know what these are. So let's define them. I really like this article from biblearchaeology.org that just gives really simple definitions definitions. So the first is the lust of the flesh. This is anything that satisfies or brings pleasure to our physical, uh, to our physical body. So it could be um, excessive consumption of food or alcohol or drugs or sex or something sensual or physical that's a pursuit that gets in, 
in the view or in between our relationship with God. The second one, the second temptation is the lust of the eyes. This is possessions I want that would make me happy. So this is things that we see and desire to have, and it becomes something where we focus in on it so much that it's like, I really, really want this. I want this, I want this, I want this. And usually it's something that belongs to someone else. It's a form of like jealousy, envy, or covetousness. And third is the pride of life. And this is a focus on what I wanna be or being really proud of what I am, right? So it might be like a career position or an achievement or an accomplishment and the arrogance that comes with boasting about what I'm going to do or what I have done. So those are the three distractions that are so all-encompassing and demanding on our lives that if we let them run rampant, if we don't put them in check, if we don't let Holy Spirit speak to us and say, hey, this is turning into an idol, this is turning into a thing, you know, we, we, it will become so, so all-encompassing that we will lose the love of the Father in our lives. He's, he's putting something here at stake, right? So this is a big deal. But here's the, here's the other part of this. These warnings, these temptations are so old and we see people running into them throughout scripture. So in Genesis 3, 6, we see the very moment that these temptations were introduced. So when Eve saw that the tree was good for food, that's the lust of the flesh, that it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, right? That's what she wants to be. This is the pride of life. She took its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. And thus, these three temptations have entered into our human experience. And throughout history, we have been wrestling with these three things. These are the three things that prevent us from remembering that God is our father and that we are his children. Thousands of years later, the Israelites were entering into the promised land and God saw it coming because there's nothing new under the sun. The same three temptations. He's like, okay, so we've been doing this for thousands of years in human history and just FYI, it's not gonna be different, but it's gonna be a lot better there, okay? You're gonna be in the promised land. So Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 12, he says, it says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers and you enjoy prosperity, food, drink, clothing, shelter, the fruit of the fields, vineyards, olive groves, the riches of cattle, gold and silver. It's not not bad. I mean, there's a few things I would add to that list if it was my list. Um, but then he says, then be careful that you do not forget the Lord because you're probably going to, because they've been living out in tents in the wilderness, right? It's been kind of rough and they've been relying on God for everything from water to food to safety and protection. Even their clothing wasn't wearing out, right? So here's God saying, hey, we're going to bring you into this new land and you're going to finally have everything you've wanted. And at first you're gonna be really grateful and you're gonna see me as the source of that and then your eyes are gonna kind of flatten out. You're gonna stop looking up and you're gonna start looking horizontal. And you're going to start focusing on these three temptations. Don't forget about me. So we know that these are the temptations that the Israelites wrestled with. And these temptations led them to pursue other religions and other gods. And those religions and other gods caused them to practice some very, very grotesque religious rituals that ultimately God needed to redirect them. And they often ended up in exile. If you've read the Old Testament, you see them coming in and out of exile because they would get distracted with the cultures and the riches and all the things that were around them. And they would replace the true God with these gods that they could see horizontally. And God would have to snap them out of it. He gave them many warnings. Those are called prophets, right? Over and over and over again. He was like, hey, come back to me. Look up. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. You are a child of God and I am your father. Remember who you are. And when we forget who we are, we fall prey to these temptations. <clears throat> so this has been an ongoing struggle for humanity all throughout history. But finally, in Luke chapter four, we see a redemptive moment where Jesus faces off against these three temptations and he wins. Satan challenging Jesus to turn the stone into bread was a confrontation of the lust of the flesh. Satan testing him with the desire to see and covet all the world had to offer was the lust of the eyes. And tempting Jesus to prove his divinity by jumping off the cliff and having all the angels come and rescue him, that was the pride of life. Jesus, in, in the wilderness, fasting 40 days, he's, he's being tempted, right? He's being tempted to, um, to like, with all the riches of the world, to prove, to prove who he is, to prove that he's God's son, or to just fill up his hungry stomach. 
right? He is being tempted and he passes. And he passes because he has the spirit of God in him and he's using scripture to confront Satan, right? Amen. And Jesus passed these tests and with with this pass, right? I think Satan was a little worried at this point, right? Because every single other human except Jesus had gotten tripped up. So he probably saw the writing on the wall. It's like, oh crap. I'm gonna have to come around again and get him because every other human being has fallen prey to these temptations and here Jesus has passed. So along with that moment and Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus ushered in a new world system that no longer leaves us powerless to these temptations. We're no longer just like, oh, I'm just a person. This is just how it has to be, right? So you've heard, you heard Paul talk about the fact that grace in the new, in the new world system that Jesus brought in actually holds us to a higher standard than the law because we have the spirit of God inside of us. We're no longer powerless. We're no longer just trying to check the boxes, no longer trying to just meet the standard because we have God in us for the first time in human history right? This was huge. But we can't overcome temptation. We can't remain in the love of God. We can't remain as children of God and remembering that he's our father unless we know what we're watching out for, right? So what does this look like in our present day, okay? Because as you see throughout the Bible, you see the, the temptations, they, they morph, right? Now, most of us can say that we haven't like melted down our jewelry, in like the backyard fire pit and then poured it into a little cast that was like a a cow or maybe a ram and like fashioned the heads and then waited for it to dry and then set it up on the mantle in the living room and then brought all a bunch of food and incense and then we maybe like, you know, worshiped it and asked it for things. Now, this is still a practice in some cultures, right? We see this. This is definitely still happening around the world. But in the United States, with our Judeo-Christian practices, predominantly Judeo-Christian practices, we don't do that here. And so it's really easy for us to think, well, I don't have something that's taking the place of God because I don't have an idol, a physical idol that, that is, you know, in my living room requesting my attention, Okay, but anything that is in your life requesting your attention, that causes you to forget who you are and who God is. That is one of these temptations that we're being warned about. And so it can be the the pursuit of pleasure, the pursuit of adventure, always doing something new or just having fun, new possessions, achievements, accomplishments, the next bigger and better thing. This is built into our nature and culture. And social media has amplified it, right? Because now, like when, it used to be that before social media, we like didn't know what the people that, were, that we went to high school with were doing. Unless you like were still friends with them. And I really don't talk to very many people from high school. Um, socially, I just wasn't, I, wa- I didn't arrive until much, much later. <laughs> Um, I was just a strange kid. So in high school, it's like, I'm not trying to relive that because that was not the glory days for me. Um, So if it weren't for social media, I just literally wouldn't know where anyone was, how many kids they had, what kind of job they had, if they had gained weight or lost weight, uh, how much money they had, how many vacations they were taking. And now we know, right? And so now we're in this constant sense of comparison, like, oh, uh, this person got married. I, I feel like I should hurry up and get married. Oh my God, something's wrong with me because I'm not yet. Or um, th- they're already having kids. These people that I went to high school with, they have like three kids and I have like zero kids. I have a pet. Does that count as a kid? Um, and so we feel like we're constantly looking at everyone around us to say, are, am I where, you know, where they are? Oh, they're retiring already. Wow. They must have you know, really worked hard to save up for that, or, um, you know, they really came into some money, or they were just smarter with their money than me, or they made a lot more money than me, right? We're just, it's this constant state of comparison, and we begin to feel like we aren't progressing, we aren't, like, it can feel moral, right, to make progress in life, to do the next thing, whatever that next thing is in your face, it can feel like a moral failure to not do that. You know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, I'm not this yet. I'm not that yet. I'm still working this job. It's a little bit entry level. I have a story about this that I'll share later. It can feel like we're not 
progressing and that maybe something's wrong with us, right? Or maybe like, is this my fault? Is it God's fault? Whose fault is this? And so we can begin to look at all of these accomplishments and these trappings and this stuff in our lives, and we can start to see it as like evidence of our own goodness, right? And and that's how we begin to forget who we are. So we need to know really honestly, what are these temptations that are tripping us up? What is causing us to forget who we are? For, for some of you, it might be craving new experiences or travel. Like you, you, have, you follow all like the travel um, blogs on Instagram and they're always like showing you pictures of the cabin in Finland and you're like, dang it, when am I ever going to get to Finland? You know, this definitely happened to me yesterday, so this feels like acute. Um, you might be a foodie and so there's always a new restaurant opening up and you're just like, okay, I got to go there, I got to go there. Um, and you, you want to like just experience it, right? Or maybe... Maybe you love making new stock market investments or real estate investments, and you just love like making money. You, you probably do great things with your money, but you love making money, and that's fun for you. Or maybe you have big career ambitions, right? You want to start your own company, or you want to like, you know, become CEO of a Fortune 500 company, or you want to save up X amount before you retire. And so there's always just a next step that you want to take. It's like you, you have this goal, and you achieve it, and you're like, ah, and then you make another one, right? It's hard to even celebrate when you actually achieve something. So to be honest, I have, a, I'm, I get stuck on a few of those. Um, I don't think I'm a foodie because I don't really like know how to describe it. You know how like this food it blogs, they like describe food. And I'm like, where did you get these words from? I didn't know those were words. Um, I just like to sit there and, and enjoy it. But a big thing for me that I can just completely go down the rabbit hole is fashion. So I can get on these Instagram um, you know, just like a hashtag or something. And uh, I found this website, like, I don't know, a decade ago called Man Repeller, which is like fashion that's like so cute, but also really ugly. You know what I'm talking about? Um, and so I was like, I was like, I love this so much. This is amazing. And so I love like finding a look and like going through my closet, and, like putting it together. Um, And I have these like, you know, apps on my phone for shopping. And of course, you know, work from home. You know, there's like work from home fashion during, during COVID. I was all about that. I was like, I have looks. I have looks for sitting in front of my, in, in my, on my couch. Um, I just really, really love it. And so actually yesterday it was, <laughs> I had a little moment because yesterday I was, um, you know, preparing my sermon and uh, I was like, oh, I need, this, I need this oversized blazer for this look that I want to wear today for church. And so I was like, I come out and I and tell Josh and I'm like, all right, I'm going to H&M because I need this, I have this look in my mind and I have to like get it. And he's like, well, actually, I have an oversized blazer for you that would probably fit you. And I'm like, oh, okay, let's talk about that. I, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to compromise because H&M closes in like 20 minutes. Um, and so we go in the back. This is Josh's blazer. Thank you. Um, and I was like, look at those fabulous shoulders, right? Um, I was so loving it. And so anyway, it was just really funny because I was having this internal battle because here I am. I am constructing this message and I was like do I really need another blazer because I already have like a lot of them Um, but I did need another blazer but now I have one I love how God you know creatively met my need isn't that fun Um, so so here's the thing here's the thing okay I do not want to come across and say that your love for adventure or travel or investing or achievement or whatever it is, is like sinful, okay? I want you to hear me. This is not, it's not about it being a sin. It's the moment that it becomes a thing where you forget who you are. It it becomes who you are, right? Our first identity beyond every single thing, beyond being even like a Christian and culturally or being an American or being you know, even your gender, right? The thing that's most important about you is that you are a child of God. And so the thing, anything that would come in the way of that, anything that would be a a bigger identity or a bigger focus, that is when it becomes sinful because it means that we're disconnecting. We're disconnecting from God. We're disconnecting from ourselves. We're disconnecting from others. And that's when it's harmful to us. And so no matter what our family background or our personality type, there's one of these three that tends to trip us up. And we want to know what those are. So 
John reminds us here at, at, towards the end of this selection, uh, 1 John 2, 24, he says, as for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Father. So how do we protect the word in us? There is a lot at stake, right? There's a lot at stake. The, the love of the Father, I want the love of the Father to remain in me, right? I don't want to forget who I am. I know what that feels like. There's a lot of anxiety around that, right? There's a lot of anxiety around when we forget who we are. That's actually gonna be one of your telltale signs because you're gonna feel like, oh, I have to run. I have to, I have to get this next thing. I have to become this next thing. I have to do this next thing. I have to get this next look for me, right? I have to try out this new place. I have to you know, travel to this new, this new country that I just heard about, right? I saw this, this travel deal and I have to get it. Anything where there's that panic or anxiety, that's a moment where we're starting to disconnect. Pay attention to that feeling because that's a moment where it's like, oh, I'm forgetting who I am and I'm forgetting who has my back. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he addresses these concerns. He actually talks to them. He doesn't say the three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, but he talks about um, these, these, the situations in our life that arise that create these temptations. So in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, he says, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where your treasure, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I like how um, Paul helps Timothy understand this a little bit more, right? Because again, sometimes the Bible can get a little abstract. And it's like, what does that mean? Like, I do not know how to deposit things in heaven, okay? I don't know how to do that. So Paul, uh, t- Paul reminds Timothy of this. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. I love that verse. I love that verse. Because God is, God is going to take care of us, right? We can put our hope in God, not in riches, because we can trust that God's gonna take care of us. He's, he knows what we love, he knows what we need, and he wants to provide for us. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So there you go. That's how you do it. That's how you lay up treasure for yourselves in heaven, by being generous with what you have. Now, some of you might say, well, I'm not rich. Well, we are still in like the top 1% wealth-wise around the world, right? So if we're sitting in this room, we have considerably more wealth no matter what our bank account says. Uh, because of the, maybe the connections or the opportunities um, that we have here in our country, which we're very fortunate for. So let's head back to the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke 12, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. I'm hearing that one, Jesus. Okay, is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And who by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Don't worry about it for the pagan world runs after all such things and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough trouble of its own. Can we get an amen? Amen. Right? Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions. Give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief can come near, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I love that verse so much. Do not be afraid, little flock. Okay, do you hear that fatherly voice? Do you hear that? That's calling you back to being the kid. You don't have to be the adult. When it comes to God, you're always a kid. Okay, you're always a child of God. You're never like the grown adult of God that like comes in for holidays. Okay, you are the child of God always. And so the father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. There's so much patience, so much kindness in his voice. And he, you could tell he has it already. He's, he's given you everything. He's saying, hey, you don't have to hold on so tightly to this little tiny physical thing. 
that you have, this money, this little bit of money, this house, these clothes, these achievements, you don't have to hold on to that because the Father has been pleased to give you everything because of who you are, because you're his child, right? I remember six years ago, I was working on Fort Riley in the hospital, and I was in behavioral health. My background's in clinical social work. Um, and I had been like back and forth on whether or not I wanted to do, like do program administration or actually be a therapist. And I'd been really wrestling with this. And so I'd been recruited for this position that was uh, a program administration position. And I had been like really kind of walking away from the therapy route. And so this was, I, I'd been in this kind of like entry level role for a while. Oh my gosh, Karen's laughing because uh, I worked with Karen um, back there. It was, so I was in this entry level role and it was like basically um, we, everybody had so many degrees around me. Everyone was like so important. I felt like basically it was like even my having a master's was like the equivalent of a high school diploma where I was. And so I, not only that, for the first few years, like when I had my first baby and all this stuff, I didn't have an office. I would come in every day and I literally didn't know where I was going to go. And so I was trying to like, you know, um, be a mom and do these different things. And it was like really stressful, you know, just to feel like kind of homeless within this space. And so as you can imagine, here are all these like PhDs, PsyDs, MDs, DOs, you know, people with clinical in their name. And I was like, ah, you know, like I thought this was cool to get a master's degree. And now like I'm instantly coming into a situation where I'm the freshman, you know, I'm not, I have, I have zero, I'm not cool. And I was so eager to get out of that because insignificance is a big trigger point for me. Right? God's been working with me on this. But I hate to feel small. I hate to feel insignificant because I'm like, I am important and I'm supposed to do big things. And why am I a plebeian in this place? Right? Like nobody cares about me. I, I'm like, I, I got to get out of here. So it was a big internal wrestling match. And finally, someone had seen the light and seen how much greatness I had to offer and had recruited me for this position. It was a big pay raise. It was like all the stuff. So I started doing the work like got into the job, kind of was doing some of the work, um, not the whole job, but I was doing part of it. And my boss who had recruited me had helped me write my resume because in the government system, you have to like write it just so, so it goes through the keyword search. Um, because if you write it, it doesn't even matter if you're the wrong, right person for the job, it will kick you out. So he made sure that it had been written perfectly so it would go through the system. And we, I remember being at like a, an event um, for work, and we were both there, and we were laughing about it. We're like, ha ha, it's going to be so funny when I, you know, when I get through this job, and, or get through the, the hiring process, and like, I wonder who's going to get the job. We were like laughing about it, like, obviously it's me, right? And then something happened. I did not get through the system. Somebody else who had prior military experience, who had the same credentials as me, and even had my same first name, Oh yeah, because God was like, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, at this person, who is a fabulous person, by the way, but she came in and she got the job. And you know what I got to do? I got to train her. <laughs> yeah. And so you want to know what I did when I came home the day that I found this out? This was six years ago, like July, six years ago. I definitely like threw something. I don't know what it was. It might have been my phone, but I walked in the door and I definitely threw an adult tantrum. Okay, I'm not proud of it, but I'm just, I'm just saying, and clearly this had become, I had forgotten who I was, right? Because I was like, I'm so small, I'm so insignificant, I have to get out of here, I have to matter, I have to matter, and this is gonna be a pay raise, and people are gonna like see me as important, and this was my exit strategy out of being significant, and God was like, nope. And so, whoa, was that uncomfortable. And I was very upset. And I was like, I don't understand what happened. But I started to realize I need to like hold th things with an open hand, right? I need to hold things with an open hand. So God eventually kind of gave me this renewed vision for therapy. I decided I want to start my own practice, my own business. I, I did that uh, about two years later, right? I, I couldn't have seen that coming. Um, so I, I left Fort Riley, started my own practice. And then two years after that, I was running for city commission, on an entrepreneurship and small business platform, which I definitely did not see coming because I wasn't planning to run for office for like 20 more years. And so I was like, I'm in my 30s running for office, what is going on, right? And then after that, I thought, okay, 
God called me to run for office. Like, I'm definitely going to win. I had all this support. Uh, the newspaper endorsed me. That was supposed to be a big thing. And then I didn't win. I was like, okay, I'm seeing a theme here um, where I'm getting recruited for stuff, and then it doesn't happen. What the heck? is going on. But you know what, you guys? It took me 36 hours to recover from not winning the city commission election. Whereas losing this job in 2015 took me a long time. I had learned how to hold things with an open hand because I had learned more who I was. And so five days after the election, I got recruited to help start this regional entrepreneurship center, which I now run, okay? That was the point. That was the point. The whole time I was being formed. And, and even what I'm doing now, that, that'll be, you know, this is the formation process for the next thing, right? We're always in the formation process for the next thing. But I was thinking, it's this. It's this job. This is what's going to help me. This is, my, this is the identity switch that I need to make. And God was like, no, it's something else. And what is so amazing is that th- the work that I'm doing now has an enormous amount of purpose, There's so much that I get to do every day that is aligned with the will and vision of God to bring economic equity into our community, into our region, to be able to help small business owners change the the trajectory of their family. Do you know that entrepreneurship can help people change their family financial history in one generation? right? No matter where they're coming from. It is so powerful. I love it. It is infused with purpose. And I start, I got here by saying yes to the few things in front of me, even though I didn't understand what was going on and holding loosely to things. Because ultimately, again, is my identity a therapist? Is my identity being a program administrator? Is my identity being, you know, whatever? No, it's being a child of God. So that means that my life isn't mine. That means that I go where I'm called. That means I go where I'm assigned because that's my my biggest biggest criteria for who I am and what I do. I love how Martin Lloyd-Jones talks about this. This pulls it all together. He says, what made the heroes of the faith prepared to do the things they did? It was that they desired a better country, a heavenly one. If we have a right view of ourselves in this world as pilgrims, as children of God going to our Father, everything falls into its true perspective. We shall immediately take a right view of our gifts and our possessions. We begin to think of ourselves only as stewards who must give an account for them. We are not the permanent holders of these things. This is the great principle of which I must constantly remind myself, that I am the child of the Father placed here for his purpose, not for myself. I did not choose to come. I have not brought myself here. There is a purpose in it all. God has given me this great privilege of living in this world, and if he has endued me with any gifts, I have to realize that although in one sense all these things are mine, ultimately they are God's. I do not cling to these things. They do not become the center of my existence. I do not live for them or dwell upon them constantly in my mind. They do not absorb my life. On the contrary, I hold them loosely, I'm in a state of blessed detachment from them. I'm not governed by them, but I govern them. And as I do this, I'm steadily securing and safely laying up for myself treasures in heaven. So how do we practically live this out? I want to leave you with these next steps, okay? First off, do you know that talking to yourself is a thing? Okay, I'm a therapist. I can tell you that talking to yourself is good, okay? There are certain versions of talking to yourself that are not good. Come see me afterward if you're not sure, okay? But first off, you have to talk to yourself. If you look at the Psalms, David is always talking to his soul. He's like, soul, why are you so downcast? Don't you remember? God loves you. He's always talking to himself. Talk to yourself, okay? Remind yourself, hey, you're a child of God. He's your father. He's got you. What are you worried about? What are you stressed out about, sweetheart? You can literally talk, be super kind to yourself. You know how you talk to like, a, a grandchild or a child or um, an, a nephew or niece, talk to yourself that way, right? Kindness, okay? It's God's job to take care of you. He richly provides everything for your enjoyment. And you know, if you forget this, you can just go back and read um, what Luke 12 was talking about, right? Don't be afraid, little flock. Don't be afraid, little sheep. For the Father's been pleased to give you the kingdom, So you can hold everything loosely, right? Why can we hold things loosely? Because of who we are. It's not about God standing in front of you and saying, give me all your stuff, okay? 
It's never about that. God only asks us to do things based on who we are. It's about who you are first, and then out of that place of identity, then you do, okay? So it's never about like, I'm gonna try really hard to do good, no. Then you have forgotten who you are. Remember who you are, remember who he is, and then you will do good because you will not be afraid. You will not be afraid because you will know that he's got you, okay? Reset your focus in prayer to being about knowing God more, not just about getting stuff. A lot of times, we're, our prayer journals, our prayer times, our prayer walks, our prayer drives where we're driving from one place to the next, God plays all me, blah, 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 right? It's just about the next thing. Okay, it's about like, God, help this thing go well that I have made be a bigger thing than you in my life. Help me to get what I want so my anxiety can go away. How about that one? How about that one? Help me to get what I want so my anxiety can go away. Um, no, because God's not really into that. Okay, so like, don't pray that prayer because it's probably not gonna happen. All right, seek first his kingdom right? Seek first his kingdom and all these things will be given to you. And remember that you're not here for yourself. Hold loosely to what you have. You are not here for yourself. You are not here to accumulate achievements and stuff and people and money and clothes and experiences. That is not why you are here. You are not here for yourself. You did not bring yourself here. You are here for a purpose. And the only way you can ever step into that is when you remember who you are. This is his world. You're living the life he gave you, and we are pilgrims first. So I'm going to leave you with this quote that we started with. The great secret of life, according to our Lord, is to see ourselves and to conceive of ourselves always as children of our Heavenly Father. That's the secret. Okay? You know, like, that video on YouTube? It's like the secret, and they whisper it, and it's about the law of attraction. That's not the secret. This is the secret. Okay? The secret is remember who you are. Remember that you are a child of God and that he is your father. Okay, I want to pray for us. Uh, if the worship team will come up, um, you guys can get in your places. Just pray with me. Lord, we thank you that you are our father. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus here, your only son, to bring us all into your family so that you wouldn't have an only son. You would have many sons and daughters. We thank you that even when we were at odds with you, even when we were disobeying you, even when we didn't care about you, when we scorned you, that you came for us because you saw that you wanted, you wanted reconciliation. You wanted us to remember. You wanted us to look in your eyes and remember that you're our father and that we're your children. And then that is the core of who we are. And so, Lord, we ask that today there would be some piece of this truth that would go with us, that would take root in our hearts, that would take root in our minds, and would begin to transform our lives. Teach us how to be your children. Most of us, we had, you know, regular to abnormal to dysfunctional families. God, lots of us did. And so help us to know, what does this mean? Is it good that God is my father? Is that okay? Lord, teach us how to be your children. Teach us how to be loved by you. Teach us to let you provide for us. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. This teaching was recorded in partnership between Tallgrass Community Church and The Well. For more resources like this, visit tallgrass.church and thewellmhk.com.